Hey, what is going on, guys? Hope you're having a fantastic Sunday. Welcome to Sunday Night Live. Ryan, good to see you, man. How you been? Welcome back. Uh, <laughs> I, I've been. <laughs> Ryan has to really think about it sometimes. Man, sometimes th today's been one of them days, man. And then you responded that every day is one of those days. And yes, it is one of those. <laughs> every day is one of those days. But sometimes your kids just stress you more than others. And luckily, my wife and my youngest are downstairs making cookies that's there what we're you having go. for dinner is cookies dude, and cupcakes dude that that'll make the day go better man or it's gonna make it go a whole lot worse later it just depends on how many i eat <laughs> it's all good man good to see you oh, you're safe oh I'm doing I'm, i'll be honest man we had an incredible day at church this morning they had a just a phenomenal time of worship it was just really just one of those things they had the choir they had just a big kind of deal it was awesome so, and then we had some friends over right after that and we hung out with them, had lunch. Um, they came back from a mission trip in uh, Alaska. So that was really cool to spend some time with them, but we hung out with them pretty much most of the day. So definitely just a cool day. We got a new bed. So that was yeah. pretty cool. So, but um, got that all set up. And so we'll get the chance to sleep in that tonight. So mm -hmm. yeah, man, super, super good day. Let me say hi to some folks in the chat. Alexander, good to see you. Caleb, jo uh, Jordan. Uh, looks like we got Ryan and Kevin. Chris is in the house. Who else we got? I'm not going to hit everybody. Poncho, good to see you, man. Alexander, we've got some folks, I believe, from the Netherlands. Let me know in the chat where you're viewing, where you're watching from. Little Wiki, good to see you, buddy. Very, very cool. So Chris asks, is my mic okay? Does my mic sound weird? To me, it's fine. I'm hearing him just fine. Let us know in the chat if Ryan's mic is okay. I'm hearing you just fine on my end. Yeah, check the gains and it looks like it. Am I hot? Where's Jonathan? Jonathan had a sore throat, so he bowed out. I should have just said we kicked him off for his terrible opinion. <laughs> so, now he has a sore throat, so he didn't want to um, come on and have everybody laugh. Or he, he, no, nah, he didn't want to spread it to you guys. Looks like we got some folks from Germany, <laughs> Canada. <laughs> Through the interwebs. Yeah, dude. Check this out. We got folks from Texas. Good to see you, man. I love hearing that we've got people literally watching and hanging out and, and, you know, being a part of the conversation from literally all over the world. We all bring a kind of a different perspective and even just different experience to uh, the conversation. We got some KC guys in the house. Caleb, good to see you, buddy. Miguel's in California. Chris, Nebraska. Love Is my it, mic better now? I turned it love up it, a little bit. bit. Is that better? Cool, man. Watching from Germany. Man, we got a couple folks from Germany. Super, super cool. Well, guys, we're going to go ahead and jump into it with the Sunday Night Live streams. Really, we'd like to, we'd like to tackle one topic right off the bat, and then we're going to jump to your questions. So if you've got questions, it can be about anything home theater related um, uh, or even two channel, whatever, music, movies. Drop that in the chat. Ryan will be looking through those as we have My our conversation. He's cutting out. Hmm. Is I'm it cutting out for you? I mean, it sounds okay. Well, what is, is does it sound good or is it terrible? Like, does it sound like it normally does? It's it's not chopping in and out, so I don't know. So yeah. it could be your, maybe whoever's saying that, maybe, oh, I see Keith. Maybe just try to refresh your browser. Maybe Let that's right. Listen to it. Hold on. Yeah. Cool. But anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right on into it. So the topic for tonight, we're going to be talking about amplification. When should you add external amplification to your home theater. And so I know for a long time I rocked um, an AVR and, and you guys let me know in the chat if you are running just an AVR or if you're running external amplification. I'd love to kind of to see who's kind of running what. And uh, but we just want to have some conversation on that, because I think at some point during your home theater journey, you're going to at least entertain the thought, should I add an amplifier to my my setup. And so I think we're going to just talk about some good conversation here on like, when is a good time to do that? Um, so Ryan kind of think through when, when would you say it would be a good time to add external amplification? Like what would be one of the reasons? Oh, we lost him there. No, here we go. Three joining to see if that fixed it at all. Yeah. You sound okay to me. So we'll just go with it. If it's rough in the chat, we apologize. Not really sure. So I'm just looking in the chat. So we've got some some that are running amplification, some are doing 
uh, Denon AVRs. We've got Anthem AVRs. Some of them say, I don't need the, uh, the extendable running some Anthem. So a lot of stuff, monolith X seven, fantastic amplifier, just starting to add some amplification from Chris. Okay, cool. Ooh, Caleb said you sound fine and look fine too. <laughs> hey, Hey, all right. Let's, let's, yeah, there you go. It's let's cool. get on it. So cool. So let's talk about some different reasons why you would need to add an external amplification. Most of the time when we get into this hobby, a lot of times um, we're just starting out and we don't have a ton of budget. I know that's where I was at 15 years ago. I was buying used um, AVRs and a lot of times they were kind of the budget friendly. They were the ones that are in the $500, $600 range. And so a lot of times with those budget or entry level AVRs, they just don't have a big power supply. And if you're running, say, for instance, five speakers and a subwoofer, you're going to be totally fine with just about any receiver for the most part. It's when you start adding seven and nine and 11 speakers that a lot of times that amplifier, that AVR could struggle. And I think there's some different reasons why it could struggle. So let's kind of dive into that. What, what could cause an AVR not to have enough power? What are your thoughts on that, Ryan? Driving too many speakers. Well, not too many speakers, but more speakers, right? Because sure. most of the time, the power rating that you guys see in the AVRs when you're looking at the specs list is with two channels driven. Correct. They do that, I think, to be a little bit, bit misleading, right? Because they want to showcase that you have more power. And <clears throat> when you start adding channels that that amplifier now has to draw, mm -hmm. that maximum output is going to drop. So just be very aware that when you start adding more channels, which... Virtually everyone is going to do past two channels. Yeah. Um, you're going to have less power output and thereby a lower power ceiling before you get into distortion. So yeah. that can, and then um, ohms loads for sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, so what having, do you, what do you think? yeah, I'm totally with you. So the more channels that you're trying to add, the more of a load that it's having to carry. And I kind of equate that to, um, well, prime example, let's just do something really basic. Let's say I'm bringing in the groceries. You know, I can carry, you know, probably 10 or 15 bags myself, but what if there's 20 or 30 bags, you know, and there's a lot of laundry detergent and things like that. It's really hard for me to carry all of that. But if I hand some to Ryan, he can carry some in. All right. I don't like the grocery analogy. I was just doing that because we bought groceries today. We're just flying by the seat. <laughs> I thought it was but, all right. So off ship. Yeah, let's say we're we're just we're carrying in something heavy. Ryan and I are or I'm trying to move a big speaker. I've moved a hundred pound speaker by myself. I've carried it, picked it up, hauled it from my living room to my theater room. But if I have Ryan come over and help me out, now we've divided that load. And so it makes it a whole lot easier. The problem is though, the more speakers, you know, your amplifier, your AVR only has so much of a power supply. Okay. And so the more of the load that you add to it, the more it's going to struggle. And so if you can, kind of let go of some of that load with, um, you know, an external amplifier. It's just going to be able to do that a lot more efficient. So definitely, I think the number of channels can impact that. And I, one thing I want to say is that, no, I'm not flexing at all at 20 bags of, of groceries. Um, but, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about how many, I, I guess there's just not hard numbers as far as, Okay, if you're running seven speakers, you need an external amp. Or if you're running nine, we're just going to give you some parameters that you really need to look at. So number one, how many speakers are you running? The more speakers you have in your uh, your setup, the more potential that you could definitely benefit from an amplifier. Another reason um, that you mentioned, Ryan, is uh, the sensitivity. Did you say the sensitivity? I said you talking? Ohms, but sensitivity okay. and yeah. Okay. So well, let's talk. Let's talk about yours. The ohm load. So, certain speakers are rated at let's say eight ohms, and usually it says eight ohms nominal. And one thing I didn't know for a long time is if you've got an eight ohm speaker, it doesn't mean that 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 load is eight ohm throughout the entire um, you know the content that you're playing, whether you're playing a music, uh, you know, music, or if you're watching a movie, that resistance changes. Okay, or that impedance, I guess, changes. And so talk to us a little bit about 
what happens when you've got, what is the difference when you have an eight ohm speaker nominal and maybe a four ohm speaker? What's the difference? There? What's the best way to explain this? Without even like getting super, super technical. It's the resistance that the driver is going to have. So the higher the ohm load of the speaker, the more resistance that you're going to have in the circuit. Now, I'm do not understand this at the level that a lot of people do. So me neither. Don't, don't, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, a lot of home th or excuse me, a lot of car audio is going to use much lower ohm mm -hmm. loads, like two ohms, because you yep. can get a lot more power correct. out of that, right? So if you're going into the home theater realm, you're starting to move more towards an eight ohm load, which is a lot more common. Um, so when you, I don't understand the specifics of it. Sure. Um, well, I can't say I don't understand it. It's that I haven't gone down that rabbit hole mm -hmm. as of recently. You probably understand this a lot more, more than I, because well, you have a background more in, in car audio where this is a lot more. Um, sure. So it is here. I'm, I'm a simple guy. So I'm going to explain it as simple as I know how. When you have a eight ohm speaker versus a four ohm speaker, the four ohm speaker is going to draw more power from your AVR. Okay. It's going to be more taxing on it. It does allow you to pull more power, but the problem is, is you're, you're demanding more power of it. So if you've got multiple speakers, seven, nine, 11, and you've got four ohm speakers, that's going to be a lot more taxing on that AVR than if they were eight ohm nominal. Um, so that's as simple as I can put it. I don't understand the mechanics of resistance, but just this keep in mind that Aaron's audio corner. And yeah, but, but the, yeah, but the real, realize that if you've got lower ohm or lower, I guess if it's a four ohm load, your speakers on the back, if you look at it or look on the website and it says four ohm nominal, then that's going to be a harder speaker to drive. And Here's so one of the, the best ways that I can put it very simplistic Mm -hmm. is the closer you get to zero ohms, the closer you get to a full on short. Mm. Right. That's so that's, <laughs> think about the closer you get to zero, the more than <laughs> closer you're getting to a totally unimpeded mm. electrical stream. Right. Yeah. So like on my Martin Logan's, the ones that are sitting behind me, mm -hmm. um, when they get up into high frequencies, they can push down to just over zero ohms, which is very, very hard on yeah. home theater amps. I mean, it's hugely difficult to do because they're right above a short and it pushes a lot of amplifiers into protection. So yeah. um, it can be very hard on amplifiers if they're not set up to deal with those loads um, in that way. So that's a really, in my opinion, a very simplistic way, but there's a lot of science that goes into this that I have sure. not delved into enough. Yeah, so I think beyond, beyond me topic anymore is just going to lead yeah. to um, things error. That, yeah. <laughs> so Not anyway, but I don't, so I want to just the as much just the short of it is if if you have four ohm speakers, they're going to be harder to drive. Okay. So another thing I think that that may determine whether or not you would definitely benefit is what I mentioned earlier, sensitivity. So when you look at the manufacturer specs of your speakers, it's going to say something like eighty nine dB sensitivity. Or it's going to say, um, you know, 94 dB or 93 or sometimes even over 100 dB. And usually what that's um, measured is they'll do one. They take a microphone and they put it in front of a speaker and they measure one meter out. So basically three feet away from that. And they just they feed it one watt. And, and sometimes it's a voltage, but basically one watt. And they take a, a dB meter and just see how loud did it get. So if your speakers are really sensitive to, so to me, if they're like 95 or higher, that's a pretty sensitive speaker. So in other words, it's going to be easier to drive. It doesn't take as much power to get that speaker to really crank in some, you know, some serious volume um, because it's so sensitive. It's just easy to drive. I remember way back in the day, I used to go to sound advice and I would go there pretty much every weekend when I was a teenager. I'd drive over to Tampa and I would listen to Bowers and Wilkins and I loved them. And um, but I always saw them. They, they hardly ever had Bowers and Wilkins 
running off an AVR. They always had these big, massive amplifiers. And one day I was, you know, just curious and I was asking them like, why in the world do you, do you have these massive amplifiers? They said, well, they're just hard to drive. And I've always heard that, you know, Bowers and Wilkins, a lot of times to let them reach their full potential, you need to drive, you know, you need to feed them some good solid power. But I didn't understand what that meant. And part of that is typically Bowers and Wilkins aren't very efficient. And so you're going to need a lot more power for them to reach the same volume because you have to double the amplification to gain three decibels in volume. Mm -hmm. So, so if you're like, you know, if, if the AVR is, is 85 dB, you have to double that amplification to get to 88 dB. And then to get another three dB, you got to double again. And, and when you start looking at, at the numbers, you know, going from a 200, if you've got, let's say, you know, your AVR, like Ryan was talking about, it says it can do 140 watts a channel. Problem is, is that's usually two channels. Okay. So by the time you add seven speakers, nine speakers, especially 11 speakers, you're going to be down to, I don't know, it might be 80, it might be 50, somewhere around there. So it's definitely nowhere close to 140. So to gain even three decibels, you'd have to double that amplification. And so that's just asking a lot from an AVR. So if you have inefficient speakers, if you have four ohm resistance or four ohm rated speakers, um, or if you're running a lot of speakers, then that definitely would um, probably give you cause to think that man, I might could definitely benefit from adding an external amplification. I think another thing is how loud do you listen? If you're not listening to like reference level and you're not listening to it, you know, just going crazy, like Ryan loves to crank his, you know, I could not see him running his whole system on uh, just an AVR. I mean, yeah, you know, well, I, mean, I think a good way to look at this, and I think we can use this as an example. Let's, mm -hmm. let's do a working example. I want somebody in chat to maybe somebody that's on the fence about should I get external amplification or not? Mm -hmm. Tell me what speakers you have. Mm -hmm. Let's just say the front mains. Um, and then tell me the main listening position, how far away that is mm -hmm. from your speakers. So in meters, how far away that is. Mm -hmm. So I need speakers and I need how far away the main listening position is from those speakers. And this is going to be a really rudimentary okay. uh, calculation of how many <laughs> let's watts. See, you let, need. Let's see how let's see how good you are at math. I definitely yeah, would not, not, not try this. Mess this up. Good question. So William says, how far or how close do I sit? I'm nine feet. But are so, you not you're nine feet from roughly? Your screen. Well, how nine far feet. Away are you from your speakers? All right, so so ten foot. I mean, my my speakers are only about a foot behind the screen, maybe. Right, so Kef R3. Yeah. What are the specs on the Kef R3? All right. Let's see. When you get it, go ahead and pull it up on the uh, the screen there. Well, I'm just all... I can't do that. You're all right. I'll do it. All right. Kef R3? Yep. Oh, he's doing the math on it and pulling those. Well, I'm uh, okay. not these doing are, the math. These are yeah. bookshelf speakers? Yeah. We'll work okay. through it together. All right. Here we go. Sensitivity. So let me roll with this. Share... Kef R3. Okay, so Kef R3. So these are bookshelf speakers. Beautiful speakers, by the way. I love the the styling of Kef. Sensitivity. All right, details. Oh, you're on Crutchfield. I'm not. Yeah. All right, sensitivity 87. So these are oh. not what I would consider efficient speakers. So this is along the lines of like Bowers and Wilkins. Doesn't mean it's a bad speaker at all. It just means it takes a lot more power to get it, you know, yeah. to really crank in. So, so that 87 means dB. So we're going to work through this, okay? okay? So at one meter, right, they are playing at 87, 87. dB, okay? Yep. So now for every doubling of distance, you lose 6 dB, okay? So now we're going from 1 dB to 2 dB, so that 87 is now 81, okay? And then we're going from 2 meters to 3.5 meters, is that what he said? Yeah. So we'll just call that another doubling of two to four. So now we're down from 81 to 75. Okay. okay. So essentially you've lost volume because of how far you're sitting from the speaker. Correct. 
Yep. And this can change depending on the type of speaker. Like Jonathan, who's on here quite frequently, his speakers, or was on here last week, his speakers, those CBT beam formers, actually lose half of the volume over that distance mm -hmm. because of how the speakers are designed, right? So in this particular case, we're down to 75 dB at his main listening position. And this does not account for EQ or any nulls or anything else that's going on in his room. This is very, very simplistic, okay? Sure. So at this point now, we're at one watt, okay? Mm -hmm. So to add three dB to that, we have to double the output. Two, so now we're at two, two watts. watts. And I'll, I'll let you keep track of this. Oh, no. All right. Let me let me do, uh, hang on a second. You can probably just do it in a calculator and just do times two, because I'm going to forget. I'm going to miss something. It's easier if you do it. All right. One watt, we're at what? 80? No, what do we say? 70? 75 dB? That is main listening position. Then two watts is 88. Sorry, 78. I'm going to see if I can share a window. All right. So this is going to be real rudimentary. All right. There we go. And then two we're at 78. And then eight. four we're at 81. Eight we're at 84. Ah. You, you should probably just copy the watt. Oh, no. Yeah. Watt equals. And then you wouldn't have to do that. It's all good. And then 16, we're at 87. Hard part is just typing numbers. I'm not <laughs> good at that. And then 32, we're at 90. 64, 93, 128, 96, 256, 99, 512, 102. Not many amplifiers are going to go above 500 mm -hmm. watts. 1024 is 105. And then we'll go one step further just to account for any type of EQ. And you may even need more than this, but then you need 2048 for 108. Man. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. That's a lot. But that's how fast things can add up. So people may think that, oh, it's inconsequential. Right. I'm at one watt. I get X, Y, or 87 dB, but they forget to account for distance to their S to their main listening position. They forget mm -hmm. that that drops them, that dropped him 12 dB, right? That was huge. So then since his speakers are already horrifically inefficient, well, they're not actually not horrifically inefficient. Yeah. They're probably about average. Um, when he starts trying to get into reference volume mm -hmm. and it's, you can't, very few amplifiers are going to be able to do that. And his speakers aren't going to be able to take that because yeah. what was his, uh, what was those speakers? Usually they have a max wattage range. Oh, I see. Um, 108, 180. Yeah. Power range. Those things will 15 take. to 180. So at that distance, supposedly the maximum output he's going to be able to get is around not even. So probably in between so less than that? like 94, okay. 95. Gotcha. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. It's 180. Uh, yeah, about 96. Yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't account for EQ. So if he EQs that, it's probably going to get even worse, right? Because the EQ is probably going to boost some stuff, right? And you have to take that into account. Mm -hmm. um, if you have nulls, it could get even worse. I mean, there's all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff that can come into play here. Sure. And remember that if you have an amplifier that that's on the fringes of, you're really going to be pushing the limits of that amplifier and you're going to be running into distortion probably. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to get an amplifier, it's also really important that you're not buying something that just meets the requirements of whatever you're trying to do. You get something that is going to have ample headroom yeah. so that you're not pushing it to the limit so that you're not running into a position where you're going to push something into distortion and create an overall worse listening environment. And that includes the speaker too, because if you start yeah. pushing the speaker hard, um, yeah past its limits you may run into issues there as well because you know that's 105 at the seating position sure. and that kef is rated for 110 db maximum output which yeah. is probably under what is required to get reference at that seating position so just things to consider it's a formula that i think a lot of people should know yeah. uh, 
Well, we probably should put that in the description when we get this video up. Yeah, that's fine. I'll and then, so let's do, here's another thought. Yeah, so let, here's what I want to do. So let's just say you had a speaker that was more efficient. Okay. So well, instead okay. of starting at 75. Tony, Tony says, let's do the 212 RTs because that's on the total opposite side of that equation. Yeah. Okay. So let's that's that. crazy efficient. I so, think they're 101. What are those, Tony? Are I think they're 101. Correct me if I'm wrong. And we'll do the same distance of four meters. Oh, the two one. I'm thinking of mine. So his may be a little different. They may Let be 99. Know. Uh, JTR speakers. Let me know if you'll find it's the 212 RTs. 212. All right. 212 RTs. It says 101. Oh, okay. Yep. I just looked it up. All right. So here's what I want to do. Let me flip back over here so I can see the so screen. 101. You lose 6 dB for every doubling of distance, right? So we're going from 101 at two meters is down to 95. And then at four meters, we're down to 89. Okay. So okay. we're starting at 89. Starting at 89. Yeah. Which is 14 dB higher than we started in the other ones. Right. All right. So now at one watt, we're playing at 89 dB. Okay. At two watts, 92. Four watts, 95. Eight watts, 98. 16 watts, 101. 32 watts, 104. 64 watts, 107. But look, now we're getting like stupid loud at this point. Yep. And we're running 64 watts. Yep. So even with an AVR, here's why I used to have Clips La Scala's. They were rated supposedly at 104 dB. Okay. So even if Clips isn't truly, uh, some people say they're not, you know, that's not really, they're, they overestimate their sensitivity. Even if they did, they're still crazy efficient. I have run tons of different clip speakers with just, you know, a decent solid AVR. And I've run them with, you know, seven channels, 11 channels, and I've run it with an AVR and I never felt like it sounded harsh. I never felt like it was running out of gas, but they were just crazy efficient. Um, so let's kind of keep going. So we got 107, 110 dB. 113, um, 116. One thing I want you to see while we're 18. showing this is 22. higher, like the more amplification you add to this equation, like here's, here's the reality. Some people look at an AVR and one AVR, you know, from this brand says, okay, we provide 120 watts per channel. The other one says uh, they provide 140 watts. And you're like, dude, I need the extra 20 watts. I want you to look at this chart. Where in the world do you see a big difference between, you know, 100 watts or 120 watts and 140? You don't. You know what I'm saying? I don't think you're going to notice a difference when you're talking that much wattage. You have to go from 128 and double that to 256 to even gain 3 dB of volume. And then this would be 121 dB, which is stupid mm -hmm. loud. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to be deaf. <laughs> Excuse me. So hopefully that kind of gives you a visual picture of, you know, the wattage that you might need, even in a in a like a just a, a real scenario. It's uh, very depending on. Yeah, it's it's you can't people shouldn't go down the line and say, oh, well, my AVR is not enough. You need to yeah. make do some math, look at the sure. specs and figure <laughs> out is my amplifier delivering what I need? And somebody brought up. um Lion MQJ brought up, he says that way too loud for anyone. No one listens to reference volume. Well, you haven't been to Kansas City. Yeah, some people, some people do. Reference volume. I but, listen about 10 dB below reference, but, but that's just that's me. That's an excellent point because if yeah. he doesn't listen at reference volume, yeah. what you need to take into consideration there, Lion, is, or anyone that's in Lion's position, figure out the level that you do listen to and then make buying decisions based on your Listening, listening preferences, sure. and listening preferences. Yeah, that's really important because there's no reason to overbuild something and spend the money needed to push to reference if you're never going to use it. I mean, you could, I guess, for ePen, but why? Yeah. Why do that if you're never going to use it? And yeah. I'm sorry, guys, if you have questions about things, I do start <laughs> them. So feel free to ask away. I do actively look at them, and then we'll get to them after. Yeah, we we'll get those as soon as we get done with this conversation. So, so definitely. So you know, when you're looking at 
at your speakers, you know, what is the ohm rating on it? What is the sensitivity rating on it? How many speakers are you driving? Do you even listen at reference level? Do you listen to it really, really loud? Or you just kind of do moderate volume? All of those things are going to take a consideration. How far do you sit from your speakers? The closer you are, the less amplification you're going to need. How big is your room? You know, if you've got a massive room, you know, it's like 30 feet by 40 feet. I mean, that's a humongous room. So you're going to need probably a lot more amplification than somebody that has a 12 by 12 bedroom, you know, or more so, efficient speakers. Right. Everything exactly. Everything goes hand in hand. It's very Correct. difficult to isolate one variable without taking into consideration everything else. Yeah. So it's really important, especially when you ask questions like this, to, yeah. to think of the whole picture instead of just yeah. trying to individualize rooms in, a, in an Correct. individual house. Right. If when you're buying a house, you're not going you're not going to buy a house based on one room. I mean, I guess somebody yeah. would, but you're going to buy a house based on the entire thing put together. Yeah. So it's really important to not overlook the entirety of something, the sum of something in the quest <laughs> of just realizing one individual. Sure. Thing. sure. Kind of along the lines of this. Um, I know we could answer this later, but it kind of ties in what we're talking about. Um, Kevin, I actually have a video on my channel called uh, just search for youth man reference volume and you'll find that video. Uh, but yes, you're correct. If you calibrate it, zero on your AVR would be reference level. So I'm usually when I watch a movie, my wife and I watched one last night and I think I was negative 10 dB. So that would be 10 decibels below reference volume. Um, so great question there. So but we'll definitely get to some more questions. So feel free to drop those in the chat. We'll be answering those uh, right after this. So are there any other reasons that somebody, well, I guess here's the other thing, and you alluded to it earlier. I think it's always a good idea to have an amplifier, but I don't think you necessarily need an amplifier in every situation. Um, I know a lot of people have said, you know, Michael, you've got Clips La Scala's, now you got JTR's. You really don't need a ton of power, and they're right. But here's the thing that I love having an amplifier for this very main reason. I know that I can drive my speakers to literally whatever volume that I'm comfortable listening to and never have to worry about my speakers being strained or going into clipping or, you know, reaching distortion. That amplifier has plenty of power to provide enough, you know, juice for those efficient speakers. I've got a combination of JTR and clip speakers. Both of those brands offer very, very efficient speakers in the high 90s and then even above 100 uh, dB. And so, again, just kind of think through your setup. What do you have? Uh, Ryan, can you think of any other reason why somebody would want to, to add an amplifier or need to add an amplifier? I think there's other benefits, and that's really not what this is about. Um, but just when should you add an amplifier? Uh, in two channel, it can go down the road of changing the sound specifically mm -hmm. people are like, Oh my God, he's saying that he's been against that the whole time. <laughs> no, I'm saying if you go down the path of like, yeah. uh, hybrid amps or tube amps yeah. like that can impart color on the sound. So there sure. are things that you can do in that regard to change yeah. how the sound is emanating from your speaker and yeah. what it sounds like when it gets to your ear. Um, here's like a good one. Here's Maybe. a good one. So Jed said, nobody told me the Marantz runs hot. The Marantz runs very hot. So does Denon. Um, so he bought an amplifier for Maybe longevity. So one thing with the newer Marantz and Denon amplifiers is you can put them in what they call preamp mode, which disables that internal amplification. Um, I don't think I've ever really kind of tested to see you know, which, you know, does it run or how much cooler it runs without those internal amplifiers. What I can tell you is I remember, I think I was reviewing, I don't remember if it was the Denon 6400 or if it was the Marantz SR8015 or SR8012. It was one of those three. And I remember I had turned everything on and I was going to do some extensive listening to it. And all I did was turn, hit the power, just turned it on. And then I went into the kitchen and I don't know if I got something to eat or I had to do something on the computer. Probably about 20 to 30 minutes later, I went back in the theater room. And for whatever reason, I reached down and I, I touched the top of that AVR. Guys, I'll be honest with you. It was difficult to put my hand on the top for more than probably five seconds. It was crazy hot. I didn't now granted, I didn't have any like, uh, 
I didn't have any signal coming through it. My speakers weren't playing. It literally was just turned on and it was ridiculously hot. And so definitely that might be another reason. I think there's a lot of benefits that you can get from amplifier, but I think that really you just need to think through, you know, I mean, it, it's always a good idea to have headroom. It's always a good idea uh, to me to offload at least some of that amplification. But can you get by and have an incredible experience with the AVR? 100%. I think you really, really can. But again, you got to think through those parameters. Do you have sensitive speakers? Do you not necessarily listen to it crazy loud? Um, you know, are they eight ohm versus four ohm? I think there's a lot of parameters there. So great discussion on that. So let's go ahead and jump over, switch gears. Uh, before we jump into your comments, I saw some here. I just want to give a little, not a shout out, but um, somebody mentioned it. I thought it was, where is it at? It's right near the bottom. Anyway, while I find it, we are getting like crazy close to 100,000 subscribers. I'm super pumped. Here we go. A couple of them, Steve. Appreciate that, brother. There was another one here as well. Really close to that one. Where is it at? Oh, man. I am not seeing it. Here we go. 1.1. 1 .1. So we're 1,100 subscribers away. So if you're not subscribed to the channel, we'd love for you to be a part of the community. Um, we're getting close. And as soon as we get close, actually, as soon as we hit 100,000, we're going to be giving away $33,000 in some really, really cool stuff from AVRs to amplifiers to subwoofers and mini DSP, a bunch of different things. So head over to youthmanreviews.com slash road to 100K and all the details will be there. Just enter. Uh, all you have to do is be a subscriber to the channel and then just find those items that you're interested in um, uh, entering. That's what I was trying to say. So anyway, enough of that. So let's go ahead and jump over to your question. Let's pop this up. So five level says, does running the front tower speakers in full range without a sub going to harm the speakers? Fantastic question. I know a lot of guys, I don't, I won't say a lot of guys. I know there are guys out there that run their front speakers in full range. This actually might be another reason why you might want to, and you would definitely benefit from running um, an amplifier with that setup. If you're wanting to run full range, this is where those speakers could definitely dip down into that lower resistance. Prime example, my original clips RF7s. Um, I was told, that, and I don't know this for a fact, but I was told from the guys at Clips that during certain frequencies, they would dip down to like two point something ohms. So that's pulling a lot of power out of an AVR. And so if I've got, you know, seven speakers, 11 speakers, nine speakers, and I'm running those fronts as full range, that's going to demand a lot of power, a lot of juice from that power supply in that AVR. So that would be another um, you know, reason that you might want to run an amplifier. But as far as, is it going to harm the speakers by running them full range? Here's my only concern about running full range. Now for music, totally cool. My hesitation running speakers full range in during movies is... Sometimes there's some really low content. And I actually did this one time with, I think it was my RF 7.2s. I was like, I'm just curious. I want to see, you know, these have big dual 10 inch drivers, right? And I played some kind of clip from a movie. I don't remember what movie it was, but it played some crazy low notes. And I, let's just say this, it didn't sound good. You know, they were, they were taking, that speaker was being driven a lot harder than what it was intended to. Um, so I tend to recommend, I, I prefer running my speakers, uh, small, letting the subwoofer handle those low frequencies. That's what it was designed to do. I don't think you're necessarily going to harm the speakers, but again, what volume are you doing? Um, you know, what kind of content are you feeding it? Ryan, what are your thoughts on running full range tower or towers in full range, um, uh, without a sub? I mean, if you're running them without a sub, it's what you want to do. Well, I mean, I know you have to. I guess, you know, I probably missed that. <laughs> now that I think about it, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> he didn't say without a sub. I was going on like, I know. All right. Uh, my bad. But I, but it's still what I was saying as far as 
if you're watching movies with that, just realize you're, I would just be real careful. I wouldn't go crazy cranking these things. Um, just know their limits, you know, and depending on the quality of the speaker, um, you know, some speakers have protection circuitry in there and it's, it's not going to allow them to play certain frequencies below uh, what they're capable of. But um, I just know from personal experience um, when I played them full range, it didn't sound amazing. Uh, they were being driven beyond and that definitely can hurt them if they're mm -hmm. like over, over excursion. Like you play, all right, think about the edge of tomorrow when the beginning plays it's playing a, well, like a 15 Hertz sine wave, 10 Hertz sine wave, feed that through a, a set of, you know, towers or bookshelf speakers, full range. And you put it at reference volume, you might be smelling some smoke. Um, so I just be careful. So definitely great question though. Any other thoughts, Ryan? No, no, just be careful with EQ because if you yeah. boost too high, especially on those low frequencies, you'll fry them. Yeah. 100% drivers, but no, there's no harm in doing what you're doing. Chris says, folks, please, please do not think you need an amp right away. And I think that's a great advice. Start with what you have, use what you have, and then listen. Okay. If you're able to play it at clear volume and your speakers don't sound strained at those volumes, then you're probably okay. You don't necessarily need an amplifier. I always ask, or people always ask me, Michael, do I need an amplifier? I'm not going to tell you what you need. You have to determine that. Listen to it. Your speakers and your ears will tell you if that is running out of gas. Prime example. Uh, early on in my home theater journey, I had a Yamaha RXV 1800. So it was rated at 140 watts per channel. And I, I think it was a seven channel amplifier. And so I was running five speakers at the time. This thing sounded phenomenal. No amplifier, uh, external amplification, but I was running clip speakers. So they were pretty efficient and sounded fantastic. Well, I ended up buying two more speakers. So I added a, a pair of surround backs to the speakers. And when I did, it just didn't sound as dynamic. It didn't sound as lively, even though I had to turn it up, you know, more on the volume than what I normally did. It just never sounded as good. It never sounded as full. And I didn't understand what was happening until I did some research online and I found a benchmark test, I think from like sound and vision. And they basically had determined when you run seven speakers, it went from like 140 Watts per channel down to 55 Watts a channel. So we yep. lost a ton of amplification and that's what happened. The and more speakers, a ton of distortion. Yeah. And so it was really just taking that and heaven forbid, if I would have had speakers that were 86 dB, like we saw earlier, 84 dB, that would, I might've hit that limit at five speakers, you know? So it's one of those things where you've got to figure out like, do I need an amp, but definitely run your, you know, most AVRs are going to do fine. You just got to be careful. Don't go crazy cranking it up. Uh, I mean, if you've got a thing maxed out, I had a guy tell me at one time, he's like, I can run my AVR wide open and it sounds great. And I'm like, you're full of doo-doo, bud. <laughs> no way. There's no receiver. that's going to. De it depends on the speaker. I mean, he's got. No I just don't see maybe. it, dude. I don't see it. I don't see him running wide open. I just think the internal amplifier is like, it's not capable of running wide open. So, but anyway, I called him on his, I called BS, but what way. if he's got his DB at zero, but his channel trims are like negative 25. He could, he could, but I think he, advocate here. yeah, I just think he was trying to show off and like, I got this. I'm like, whatever, dude. So could be on red, on to red. Uh, what do you guys think on level up on all the channels, not from the speaker levels, but from the option level channel level adjustment on the Marantz or Denon. So I've never done that separately. So I think you're, what you're talking about is inside the setup menu, of course, you have your trim levels. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about almost like a temporary um, level adjustment for, and like I said, I don't think I've ever, I know on the Emotiva you could do that and it was temporary. So it even had little buttons on there that you could bump up your center channel or your sub and then as soon as you turn off the AVR processor and you turn it back on, it was reset. So it was just 
based on your time watching. So it wasn't like a permanent setting. I think that's what he's saying. Is that correct? Not from the speaker levels, but from the option channel. I don't know why this would give you a different outcome. I feel yeah, like it would be the same. And it may be. This may not be the same thing I'm thinking of with Ema T, but theirs was but more of a... Know. I don't know enough about what the question is asking, but I feel like if you're raising trims in one capacity, you don't, you don't want to cr you don't want to crank them all the way up. I don't. If think. you're raising trims in one capacity yeah. or another, it's, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're still yeah. going to run into the same problem at the end of the day. Yeah. So maybe on to red clarify that. I am watching in chat. So here here's my suggestion. I would run your calibration, whatever AVR you have or processor run the calibration. It's going to do its best to try to balance that based on your, um, your speakers that you're using. It's going to, you know, determine, you know, it's going to know the sensitivity of it. And so it's going to figure out, okay, where do the levels need to be to try to get you at reference volume? Um, so for the most part, you shouldn't have to mess with that. I always recommend going back after calibration and using like an SPL meter just to make sure, because a lot of times mine doesn't get it right uh, with Odyssey. And so, some of the other ones may be a little bit, you know, more accurate in that area. So, but yeah, maybe give us some extra clarification on what you're referring to there. Um, and then we'll move on to the next one. So Lion says, uh, room size determines everything. If you're sitting close to your speakers in a small room, then there's no need for an external yeah, amplifier. That was something that I started earlier. I yeah. Again, I'm not sure about need is always subjective. You know, what we need is amplification whether that comes from an AVR or an ampl external amplifier, um, you know, that's, that's subjective. So, but definitely, you know, the smaller the room, the less, you know, you might need that. Chadman PA says, how much difference do you feel um, you hear going from a 5.2.4? So that's five bed layer speakers, two subwoofers and four Atmos speakers to a 7.2.4. So we're just adding two more speakers on the ground level. So that could either be like, uh, I guess, two front wide or two surround back maybe um, in a rectangular room. Uh, room plays a major role, but in general, best way to place the... Man, you got a lot of questions here, bro. Uh, best way to place the rear surround if cannot be right behind the main listening position. A lot there to unpack. I know in my setup, um, I went from a five bed layer to a seven bed layer. My room is not ideal because I had to mount my rear speakers up pretty high because of my door entrance to the room. So I don't think I'm a good judge of how much difference going from five speakers to seven speakers on that bed layer. Um, I know typically your side speakers are going to have a lot more content than the surround back speakers, but I think there's definitely some benefits of adding them for sure. Um, Ryan, what are your thoughts on 5.2.4 versus 7.2.4? The man that's got 11.2.13 in his system. Not I really. Think it's, it's diminishing returns and it can be very dependent on the type of speakers, right? It's exactly what we talked about with the amplifier thing. Not, no one thing it can be isolated from anything else in the home theater. You, mm -hmm. you have to consider variables together in order to come to the best conclusion. So the reason I went with so many channels, I have an 11 channel bed layer in a not enormous room. Uh, my listening space is probably... 20 feet long, maybe a little bit less than that. And the reason I did that is because the Martin Logans, I have a full <laughs> electrostatic bed layer and they only have a 30 degree dispersion. So if I would have gone with a limited number, I would have had holes because of the dispersion. So I think it's very dependent on that. I hate that always being my answer, but it depends, I mm -hmm. guess. I think you're going to have diminishing returns. And like, if you're comparing a, 80 or 90 degree dispersion to a, a five channel bed layer to a seven channel, I think you're going to have diminishing returns. A big part of that is going to be because a lot of content starts falling off in the channel count rapidly as you get above five. Um, the other thing to consider is what audio decoding support your AVR pre pro has access to, right? If, mm -hmm. if you're just having the basics, well, five may be beneficial. I mean, if you've got access to something like uh, Neural X with DTSX Pro, I mean, the seven may work a little bit better. It just depends. Um, 
I think for most people in most rooms, 5.2.4 is fantastic, especially if dialed in correctly. Um, I think it's much more advantageous to save the money that you would spend on those extra channels and put them into something like room treatments, better subwoofers, focus on speaker placement, EQ, all that kind of stuff instead of going down the channel count rabbit hole, right? Mm -hmm. You need to realize that there's, pro for the, in most cases, there's food left on the table that is available and should be utilized before you start bringing out more food and putting it on the same table. So Ooh. use what you got there first and build the room. If you're going from a basic room and you haven't built this yet, build the room with the idea that you're going to expand in the future. So mm -hmm. build the room, even seven channels, build yep. the bed layer of nine. Run your, run your wi wiring. Wire and mm -hmm. then run it with five. And that yeah. way the wire is there. Should you want it later, you, then you don't have to worry about you know, hiring an electrician or a local yeah. guy to come out and run it. Um, your future self will thank you. But I think for the most part, long answer short, it depends, but there's a lot of diminishing returns as well going from that five to a seven channel. For sure. sure. Yeah. Cool deal, man. And as far as best way to place the rear surrounds, if you can't be right behind, um, there's a lot of different things. Sometimes people use like wide dispersion speakers, like what I use in mine. Um, it just kind of scatters the sound. It gives you a little bit more flexibility on placement. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and sometimes we just got to use the best, like place them as best you can according to, and I would, you know, tell you to go to the Dolby's website, look at, you know, where they recommend placing if you're going to use seven bed layer speakers and mm -hmm. they'll give you some based on angles um, on there. So, Michael says, I like this question. He says, would it be a big deal having different wattage going into, or I'm sorry, going to the left and right than the center? So for example, having a five by 200 going to four surrounds and the center and a two by 300 to the left and right front. So basically he's saying, you know, can you have 200 watts going to certain speakers and 300 watts going to the other speakers? So go back to think back to the um, the chart that we were talking about earlier. It takes a I mean you have to double the power amplification to gain three decibels in volume. So going from two hundred to three hundred isn't that big of a difference. And so your AVR or your processor, when you run calibration, it'll have no problem balancing that. Okay, you're just going to have more headroom with that three hundred by two versus the two hundred by five. What are your thoughts on that, Ryan? As long as you EQ it, you're fine. If you don't, and you just put them with the same signal coming in, well, if you don't, there's probably I'm saying be like, volume, right? but I'm saying like run your calibration though. Yeah. Or, or use, EQ or use, and stuff, yeah. You're fine. yeah. Or use a uh, SPL meter to at least level match them. Yeah. Because the reality is you may, let's say you have a two by 300 from Emotiva and then you have a five by 200 from Monolith. They may have a different. Um, kind of like gain structure. So one may actually be a little bit louder. It may have a, a different, um, I don't know if I'm saying it right. Does that make sense? So either way. Day, at the end of the day, you just want to level match. Yeah. You just want to calibrate order. that. Yeah. Either with your um, internal um, room calibration. So Dirac, Clive, Odyssey, YPAL, um, do something like that or use a SPL meter. So absolutely. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Definitely a lot of guys do that. And some people prefer to run more power to their fronts. Um, I tend to recommend instead of doing like a 200 by three and then running 200 watts to your center. Now, if that's what you've got already, that, that works fine. I would recommend just me personally, I would get a three channel amplifier. If you want to put more amplification up front, definitely. But do it to all three speakers. I just think to me it's better. But Again, once you calibrate, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference. But great question there, man. Uh, is it, <laughs> so this one's subjective. Uh, Edward says, is it useful to buy amp speakers? So for those of you that don't know it, buy amp, Ryan, give us a, a brief explanation of buy amp. So there's really two things, there's buy amp and buy wire, but what's buy amp? You're splitting the audio signal coming out of the pre into two amplifiers, then running two amplifiers or multiple amplifiers into the same speaker. This can be beneficial in certain situations. 
and those situations being one was at M wave. Um, well, we were trying, we needed to, but uh, with certain amplifiers, but it was still wasn't enough. And the reason was on the needle deaths because they're such a big speaker and they're not, they need a decent amount of power, especially because they're electrostatics in a, in a very loud room, um, because of, they can be difficult on amplifiers. Um, the amps that we wanted to run them with were only 300 Watts and it wasn't going to be enough. Um, and the reason it wasn't going to be enough is because they have a passive 15 inch subwoofer. So the idea was to buy amp them and give one amplifier dedicated to the highs and another mm -hmm. amplifier dedicated to the lows. So in that way, you're sharing the load. A lot of what we talked about with Michael's, um, grocery bag analogy at the beginning, you're hey, sharing the load in, uh, in a very similar fashion, but for the most part, especially when you've got a, um, efficient speaker, it's not needed because one amplifier has more than enough juice or grunt to be able to deal with whatever you're trying to do. Now, a lot of people run into a, um, a misnomer here, and this is very common when people are comparing things. And that thing is people do not account for SPL changes when they're comparing equipment. So what can happen here is if you go from a single ampli amplified speaker to bi -amped, well, more than likely you're going to increase the SPL and what people perceive it when they hear an increase in SPL is they perceive an increase in clarity. Yeah. So it's very important that when you do this Make one sure level blind, because we as humans have a very innate ability to inject huge amounts of subjectivity and bias into anything that we do. And that's because we want to, we want to unknowingly convince ourselves that we're right and that there is some demonstrable conclusion instead of it being un inconclusive. Nobody wants to come to an inconclusive result because it's not fun to get to. You're still left there wondering, well, that didn't help. You know, <laughs> is there a difference? So we want to convince ourselves that there's always a difference. And we end up doing that by introducing bias and subjectivity. So it's very important that when you guys do these comparisons, whether it be amplifiers, speakers, biamping, any of that stuff, that you do it blind so that you don't know what you're listening to. You do it with quick switching because if you don't do it, the switching fast enough, our auditory memory is horrific. Yeah, that's it's pretty bad. Very, very bad. And you can't remember things for very long. I mean, I'm talking like seconds, not even seconds. So it's very important. Like if anybody was at M Wave, it's really important that when you do these comparisons, that you do real time switching. And the reason that's important is because you you're you don't have to rely on your auditory memory as much. It can still be very difficult to tell. And because it's very difficult to tell, was was this the same? And you'll you'll see it and experience it if you go through it. Um, but the blind thing is again with the subjectivity and the bias, if you want a certain piece of equipment to sound better, your brain will make it sound better, even mm -hmm. though there's no difference. And I've probably told this story before. Um, we did a amplifier shootout several years ago, and there were five amplifiers. I won't go into what the amplifiers were, um, but we were all convinced that there was, there was a difference. And we were doing fast switching, so we could instantaneously switch between any of these speakers. Well, not the speakers, but any of these amplifiers going to the same speakers. They were all level matched. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were convinced that there was a difference. And one of the guys takes the switcher and puts it under a jacket and starts switching them. And we still are convinced that there is a difference. And we're even at this point pointing out which amp we think is playing. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the guy in the corner with the thing under a jacket is just laughing <laughs> hysterically. And he's laughing because after we're done, he knows we're full of crap. Mm. We asked him um, what was going on. And his yeah. answer was, guys, I've been turning the same amplifier on, on, no, on no. Yeah. continually. But your brain is so good. It can mess with you. Something, even something that's not there, that we believe that there was a difference, but it was the same amplifier. Yeah. So when you do this stuff, it's really important that you go at it objectively 
Because the only person that you're hurting in these comparisons, if you don't do them right, is yourself. And that can impact huge amounts of increased spending because you're convincing yourself that there's a difference. And yeah. maybe there is, and I just can't hear it. But I have been yet to be proven wrong. So um, I really encourage everybody to try and take these in a very objective way. And if you can hear the difference yeah. and pick it out every time, a biamp speaker, you know, a very efficient speaker that's biamped, then uh, all power to you. Yeah. Um, but I can't. I, and I've yet to see somebody that can. IMZ has a good point to what you're talking about. He says, Youth Man, people tend to want to believe things sound better because they have invested money in it. Mm -hmm. And once they convince themselves, it's hard to tell them anything different. And that's true. I mean, we want to prime again. I, I bought a pair of sound amplifier. That was my first amplifier. And it was a big investment for me. It was $750 for a 10 year old amplifier. And I couldn't believe I was about to drop that kind of money. And the guy would not budge on the price because he knew it was a solid amplifier. These things last for decades. They're built like a tank. So I drove all the way to Tallahassee, bought the amplifier, brought it home, hooked it up. And I believe I didn't do it blind test, but I believe that I heard slightly better channel separation. Like I, I believed at that time I heard slightly better, you know, like the there was more detail in the musical instruments. Um, I felt like I heard a little bit more bottom end, but it wasn't like this crazy night and day. Now, was it my brain saying, dummy, you better have heard a difference. You just dropped 750 bucks on this thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And it's really hard to do that, honestly, when you're doing these things subjectively. Well, think of the psychology behind this. When yeah. you somebody is selling you something, and you listen to one, typically you're going to listen to the one that they want to demonstrate is the poor one first. And then they're going to give you a bunch of examples about why the next one is so much better. And mm -hmm. now you're thinking about all of these things and you're convinced that subconsciously that there's going to be a difference. And then you convince yourself that you can hear these things. And then you run into issues where, well, I've never heard this in this material before, X, Y, or Z media. Well, that's because you haven't been paying that close of attention to exactly what you're listening to now. Yeah. There's a lot of psychology and stuff that gets involved in this, and it's a very convoluted and messy area. But I just encourage all of you guys to be very objective about this. And if you can hear the difference, that sure. is amazing. Yeah, go for and it. I applaud you for being able to hear the difference. Um, but now, some, sometimes, sometimes AVR. So the only time I've tried this in my own setup is. Um, my AVR back in the day allowed me to buy amp, you know, basically use two of the unused channels to mm -hmm. buy amp your speakers. And so I did it and, you know, it didn't cost me anything extra. I had some extra speaker wire. So I ran one of those extra, you got to remove the jumpers from the, the two terminals and then you connect, you know, say the, the left and right to the top two and then these extra two channels to the bottom two terminals. I didn't hear any difference. Now, would I have heard a difference if I used, you know, dedicated amplifiers? Maybe. I'm just not sure that I would have. Um, but again, if you can do that blind, great. If if you love doing by amp, go for it, man. It, it doesn't hurt anything by any means. You just might That's just have lot. extra. Yeah, I mean, you're you're having ep extra amplification, especially if you're doing external amplification. So by amping can be beneficial in certain situations where you need the extra power. I just don't think I'll it's say, magical. No, no. Last thing I'll say in regards to this is that with specific hardware, when you're talking about DAX and you're talking about amplifiers and you're talking about all this different stuff, there is absolutely a measurable difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The thing that people need to remember is our ears and our eyes are not scientific measuring instruments. Mm -hmm. So yes, one may measure better than the other but the question at the end of the day is can you hear it yeah. and or can you see it and if you cannot then why does it matter so i just want you guys to ponder that when you guys are going down the rabbit hole of the buying decisions that you may mm -hmm. make in the future and consider that there's no right or wrong way and if you want to buy something because it gives you confidence that what you're hearing is the right thing then that that's perfectly fine I'm mm -hmm. just trying to give you guys, Youth Man and I are trying to give you guys as much um, knowledge that you can then take on into your own escapades in your own home theater experiences. So 
I don't want anybody to overspend. And if you can't hear it and you can't see it, there's no reason to spend money on it. At least save at least your money. It. Yep. Have an escapade somewhere else. <laughs> Jay says, are three-way speakers, example, SVS and Emotiva, better than two-way speakers for home theater like Klipsch? So here's my thought on two-way versus three-way. So what he's referring to there is the crossover or what they call the network inside a speaker. Some um, crossovers or networks have, let's just say, for instance, a two-way speaker would be um, the high frequencies are going to maybe the tweeter and then the, the mid-range and low frequencies are going to the drivers. So maybe there's two six and a half inch woofers on the front of that speaker. So that would be a two-way. Well, three-way, they would separate the high frequencies go to the tweeter. Usually they have a dedicated speaker for maybe mid-range and then they have one or two or three speakers dedicated for the lower frequencies. So I don't think, in my personal opinion, I don't believe it's a two-way versus three-way. I think it literally comes down to speaker design. I think there are companies that can make a three-way speaker that don't measure well, that sound like doo-doo, um, and vice versa. There are a lot of two-way speakers that don't measure well, that don't sound that great. So I don't think it's necessarily a two-way versus three-way. I don't think you can just generalize and say, okay, every three-way, because some people do that. They say, oh, a three-way speaker will sound better than a two-way speaker. I don't believe that. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Ryan? I think it comes down to the, the design, of, design of the speaker. Like you said, crossover yeah. design is very important Yeah. in that regard. Yeah, if you I get think... excellent crossovers designed in a three-way speaker, yeah. and you've got a two-way that's subpar, the three way is going to dominate it. Sure. Now so, with that, with that said, so one of the best sounding speakers that I've reviewed the center channel in a, a con conventional horizontal center channel was the SVS speaker. Um, just the way that they've designed that, I think it's a three way design. Sometimes they even do like a three and a half or, th or four way design. So there's a lot of different variations there. Um, but it was a phenomenal center channel. It just sounded great. The dialogue was really, really just very detailed, easy to hear. You never kind of had to turn your head and go, man, I, I didn't quite understand that. Um, I think SVS makes a fantastic center channel. Don't really know about the Emotiva. I haven't really heard a Emotiva set up um, in my home theater. I've, I've reviewed a ton of clips. I like them, but I think that the three-way Emotiva, that's just a fantastic. The Ultra is the one that I did. I haven't reviewed any of the Prime Pinnacles, but the uh, the Ultra Center, phenomenal. I think it's a really, really great center channel. But I just don't think you can just slap a sticker or a stamp that says um, all three-way speakers are going to sound better than a two-way. I think mm -hmm. there's just more involved in that, such as speaker design, network design, uh, that goes into that to determine whether you know one's going to be better than the other. Yeah, it's it's implementation and design. There's a lot. Again, you can't just look at one variable. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So this kind of goes back to earlier. Leon says, so a top of the range Denon X 8500 HA or any AVR of that standard is basically all you need. Um, so here's what I would say. The higher up you go, typically in an AVR, the bigger that power supply is going to be. You know, when you have a $500 AVR versus a $3,000 AVR. Typically that $3,000 AVR is going to have a toroidal transformer in it. That's just massive. And so it's going to have big capacitors. It's going to have a big transformer. And so it's going to be able to provide a lot more. Again, all those things that we talked about earlier is going to determine if that's all you need. How many speakers are you running? If you're running Ryan speakers on, on that AVR, it still may not be enough. It may still go into protection mode. I because it be because that because that impedance is just is trying to pull more than what that amplifier or that AVR, um, you know, can pull. So I think there's again there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. You can't just say you know oh this will be fine in most scenarios. Yeah, that eighty five hundred is a beast. It's going to have a lot of power, and it'll you know it'll take care of most speakers. Um, but again, it depends on sensitivity, how loud, distance. Is it eight ohms, four ohms? I think there's a lot of a lot of factors that could determine that. Yep. Long answers. Long answer short for me is it depends. 
Yeah. Gotham, appreciate the super chat. He says, why are coaxial speakers rare and what are the advantages? So coaxial, if you're not familiar with that, is typically when you have two speakers, so co, two speakers in one driver. And so I think like Kef uses this. Um, sometimes I think they even call it concentric drivers, I believe. Um, I know the JTR speakers that I have have a coaxial mid-range. So you've got a big horn in the middle. And then that coaxial driver produces the high frequencies as well as the mid range. Why are they rare? Um, I'm guessing maybe on. I'm guessing they're they're probably expensive um, to be able to design. I know in again going back to JTR speakers when I went and met with Jeff, um, just the coaxial driver alone was nine hundred dollars his cost. Now of course that's probably gone up over the past couple of years, but. Um, as far as advantages, I'm not a speaker designer, um, so I, I couldn't tell you. Again, I, I don't think it's I, I don't think you can put a, a blank statement that a blanket statement that says coaxial speakers, you know, would be better than a traditional speaker. You know, and separating those again, it comes down to speaker design and how that's implemented. So, as far as what advantages would a coaxial speaker? The big advantage is time alignment. And I'll just leave it at that. When you've mm -hmm. got a speaker that is has drivers at different heights, mm -hmm. right? The sound is going to be arriving at you at minutely different timings. Okay. So when you're in a coaxial, it's all coming from the same point. And the all the same plane. The same yeah. plane, the same point. And it's all going to be arriving at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that is what I understand. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, I think they can also be hugely efficient, um, mm -hmm. but um, as Tony said, all sound coming from the same the same point. Uh, there's a lot more to it. Ascendo does the same thing. JTR does the same thing. RBH does the same thing. There's quite a few. It just depends on what you're trying to get out of it. Uh, yeah. Some people don't like the sound of them. It's just there's a lot of variables. It it depends. So Leon asked a question. He says, Ryan, uh, with your situation and don't say it depends what amps are you running with your Martin Logans? Cause I know you had some issues with the amps going into protection mode and you had to kind of upgrade those, right? I've tried several different amplifiers. I've went down the heavy audiophile amplification road with PS audio and their BHK 300s, which are like 150 pound mono blocks. Um, I did, what else did I do? I did some crowns. I did the Behringers. I tried an NAD. Um, and then I finally ended up on my QSCs. And the reason they're so hard is because I listen at reference. If I didn't listen at reference, this wouldn't be an issue. Because if you're listening at, you know, I guess normal people volume. Right? <laughs> like youth man volume. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's not an issue because the speakers aren't as hard on the amplifiers with those near ohm zero ohm loads. Uh, but the QSCs, they're CX1102s, they're class H, and they put out nearly 2,000 watts per channel. Yeah. And I can still push them into protection. It still happens. And I can also almost force them, if I go above reference, into clipping. Mm -hmm. So the Martin Logans, man, they're just, the electrostatics, when you get into panels that are that big, it's it's tough to drive when you're that yeah. high in the volume range, especially as your seating position gets pushed further and further back. But I settled on the CXs. They're phenomenal. The only drawback I have with them is that they get, they're a little loud because they're class H's. Um, the fans kick on and you can hear them. So I'm thinking about doing a fan mod, um, but I'm on QSCs. And then the stack for the rest of the room is Behringer's. Yeah, it's like um, everyday Jay. He said he added a spare Crown XLS one zero zero two to his clips left and right this weekend. Coming from a Denon six seven hundred power was no issue, but I did notice a difference in sound quality. Let's see. Let's go back to some starred comments. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so here's here's a good question. So Derek says, "What's wrong with the square room versus a rectangular room?" Layman's terms. My room is 25 by 25 in his garage. Acoustically, that's very bad. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, You're going to have some massive acoustic problems in that yeah. room. Sound waves arriving at. I guess they're hitting the same time because times and you're just going to have some nulls and peaks and it's just yeah. going to be bad. Yeah. Um, you could EQ it to <clears throat> work, but it's not ideal. Yeah. So here's one thing you might want to consider. Now that's just a thought change the dimensions of the room because you've got a massive room. You could make that. I mean, you don't necessarily need a 25 foot wide room, you know? So if you're able to, bring that in some and make it more of a rectangular room acoustically it's going to be a better fit um i've just always heard that literally the worst like um not aspect ratio but the worst dimension would be a, a perfect cube you, you definitely can, you ideally can, you don't want to do that you can still get good sound it's just not ideal yeah because you're gonna have to make some corrections and so, you're gonna be fighting things in that room so mm -hmm. it's best with room design and stuff to try and minimize the things that you have to fight and square rooms are not great. Yeah. And I'll, so let me touch on my amplifier thing here again. I don't yeah. use 2000 Watts guys. It's just that my amps are, my speakers are hard on amps. So I need mm -hmm. something that's really capable. Cool deal. Well, we are running just over an hour. Ryan, take a look at the rest of the starred comments. Maybe if you see one more, we'll grab and then we'll we'll wrap it up here. So we got quite a few. Which one would you like to answer? Power conditioners. How All about right, power ahead. conditioners? And then okay. Uh, yeah, we can do power conditioners. All right. Justin Laird says thought on power conditioners. Thinking of purchasing one, but not sure how much of an audible difference it'll make, and does it really add more protection than surge protectors or dedicated outlets? So power conditioning is very dependent on what part of the world you live in. Um, I recognize that this show is international. So power conditioning can be beneficial if you live in a place that does not have very consistent power, which is, is not the United States. The United States, for the most part, has very stable power, and you're not really going to get a benefit from power conditioners power conditioners also for from what i've seen in measurements take amir now i i don't know amir personally i don't know you know his background and stuff i've just seen his measurements mm -hmm. and the measurements that he's shown is that power conditioners can actually cause certain ones that he's measured can actually cause a, a negative effect on your power delivery to your equipment depending on which one it is so mm -hmm. Don't think that you're only getting benefits out of them. However, for good power conditioners, like if you buy something from a notable company like Furman or um, I don't know, there's a million of them. Um, I'm trying to think of a huge one. APS. Uh, is it APS? No, I don't know. I have a, uh, there's a lot of them. I have a Panamax. Panamax is another mm -hmm. one. I think Furman and Panamax are the yeah. same now, uh, but they do have, they can be beneficial depending on what part of the world you live in. I look at them more as power delivery, maybe not a conditioner, but like rack mounted power strips can be hugely beneficial for more power. Mm -hmm. um, it can be beneficial to have fuses built into them in case you do get something, you know, that comes through, it can pop the fuse instead of popping everything else in your rack. Nothing's really going to stop lightning. So yeah. Wouldn't we're really in the live, yeah. We're in the lightning capital of the world, so my best advice: unplug stuff. You know, when you yeah. can. If you see the storm coming, and you know it's going to be. And even then, if you get hit by something close enough, it can jump if it's close enough. So it's. If it's unplugged from the wall. If the club, if the wall, the outlet is close enough to something, another conductor. Sure. If it's a strong enough charge. Like I'm just thinking, my my stuff's like three feet from the from the outlet. Oh, so. and you're fine. Okay. That was like, how in the world is that possible? Well, guess, electricity can jump, right? If <laughs> yeah. it's a strong enough current, it can jump. So power conditioners have their place, but don't think that a power conditioner is going to be yeah. beneficial. Jonathan, uh, I hope you're feeling better, man. Sorry you couldn't make it tonight. Um, he said that in his city, um, he's actually noticed unstable power 143 times in one month in Raytown, Missouri, which is a metro of Kansas City. The question is, is can you hear that? 
does that matter? Like what right. is, and Jonathan, I'm not discrediting you, but the, it comes down to what is the UPS consider as unstable, right? Mm -hmm. That's what can make effect. Now, UPSs, this is something I, I think a lot of people overlook. UPSs can be hugely beneficial on projectors, especially yeah. if you're in a location that suffers, or whatever. suffers frequent power outages, because if you're on a bulb projector, <laughs> That bulb needs time to cool down with the fans. And if you suffer a power outage while that thing's on and it just turns off and it's not able to cool the bulb down, you can either lose the bulb or suffer severe deterioration because it doesn't have the, the cooling capacity to be able to cool, yeah. the fan, cool the bulb yeah. down. So something to consider there. But back on Jonathan, um, it's quite possible. But again, it's what is considered unstable. Because I mean, there's always fluctuations, right? But what is, what is bad? I guess. Yeah. Maybe it. Maybe I'm not, I'm I'm not an electrician, so I don't. That would be something beyond me. Yeah. So brownouts are are definitely a bad thing. That can actually be more sure. detrimental, I think, than actually losing power. Because then you're, the I guess the voltage is dropping. Because we'll get that here sometimes in Florida, not often, but sometimes you'll see the power just kind of dim, like your lights will dim for a few seconds or a second and then it'll come back up. Really? So the only definitely... way to fix that is UPS, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you have constant, you know, yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. Definitely not a good thing. So I think UPSs are beneficial. I haven't heard any difference when I hooked up my, um, Panamax. It wasn't like I went, Oh, this is awesome. I went, oh, okay, cool. I got a surge protector is the way I looked at it. And the other benefit that I liked about it is it has, um, almost like, delay switching so in other words um i guess there's it doesn't turn like if you had multiple amplifiers plugged into it it doesn't turn all of them on at the same time um they kind of come up in a like a sequence so you can have it set up like that way so that way it's not drawing all the current at one time so all right so jonathan also says he's seen a projector bulb flicker says a power conditioner has fixed it mm. that could be interference well, I guess that would make sense with the power conditioner fixing that. Yeah. But that can come from a multitude of different things. I'm not saying the power conditioners don't <laughs> All yeah. I'm saying is for most people, you're not going to have a benefit from them. Yeah. If you've got a, pos a position where you've got something funky going on, they can <clears throat> definitely be a, a useful yeah. tool. But for the yeah. most part, you know, thinking that, oh, I'm going to plug a conditioner in and it's going to make yeah. it sound better. Yeah. No. And it's just hard for me to kind of look at, I mean, because let's, let's be honest. I mean, a lot of those are really expensive, some of them. I remember 15, I think mine was probably about a thousand dollars. Now it was given to me. It was an older unit and a gentleman said, Hey, I've got an extra power conditioner. If you want it, you can have it. And I said, sure, that'd be cool. But again, I just, I'm just thinking, man, I would much rather put a thousand dollars in acoustic treatment or a thousand dollars in a better subwoofer or another subwoofer, things like that, where I know you're going to experience, you know, some differences in sound and, and that's going to take your home theater to a, a better level than maybe just adding, um, you know, a power conditioner. So great question. Well, cool guys. It, did you say you had one more? Um, I, mean, I know we got a bunch of them, but, um, you guys have been asked some great questions. They were, that uh, was the same guy. <laughs> Yeah, so Jonathan, he kind of mentions while you're looking at that, he said he hasn't heard any audio dif audio differences with power conditioners, and that that same thing with me. I haven't heard any difference. Yeah, um, I don't really think there's anything else. I think it's a good stopping point. Yeah, well, man. Actually, I've got another one. I'll answer okay. for Gotham. All right, so Gotham go ahead. says because this is going back to the the coaxials kind of for full okay. active speakers with built-in amplifier and DSP. Should we run a separate electrical circuit? For each speaker, no. Nope. Uh, you should. You won't need to do that. They're not going to draw enough power to to need that. I mean, I guess if you wanted to, if you're really pushing the limit volume wise, and I'm talking with massive speakers that are hugely inefficient and massive amplifiers, and eh, it's still not going to cause a problem. You should. You won't need to do that. You're not drawing enough power. Um, some people may fight it and say, oh, well, your amplifier is capable of this. Dude, you're never like my 2000 watt amplifiers. I'm never using 2000 watts. I just yeah. need it because I need a really robust amplifier 
that can handle a virtual short. That's why I have them. So you're not, I'm never going to need that. I mean, I, my whole rack is fed off of 120 amp and I've got 20 plus speakers coming in through that rack. I mean, I've got 13 amplifiers on that circuit and it's fine. So you could split your room. You definitely do not need to worry about one circuit for every speaker. That's overkill. Unless you're worried about something else in the, in the signal chain. Um, maybe do parts of the room if you're really worried about it. Mm -hmm. but bed layer and then your Atmos and all that stuff. Um, but I don't, I don't think you need to worry about that. Well, super cool guys. Hope y'all have an incredible week. Couple of things before we wrap up here. Um, number one, if you've got any audio video needs, um, Ryan is a dealer. So definitely hit him up. Ryan at ascendav.net. Uh, to... Yeah. Oh, cool. So you got some Audis, I believe. Is Audis. that how you pronounce? Audis, Audis. and Hi-Fi Man. So okay. if you need either of those, hit me up. Yeah. Somebody asked me, they're like, youth man, what kind of headphones you got there? And I said, these are about 30 bucks, man. They are cheap. So I don't do any kind of major listening. I just need to be able to hear when I'm keep Jessica from here. And you know, when I'm editing videos late at night, um, so that's happening. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we are getting super close. We're 1100 subscribers away from a hundred thousand. Absolutely. am just extremely grateful for you guys that continue to watch the content. You like it. Um, sharing it, asking questions in the comments, sharing your thoughts. And so I'm just super grateful. And as soon as we hit a hundred thousand, we've got, uh, I think there's $33,000 in giveaways, but you can head over to the website, youthmanreviews.com. There's a link right on the homepage, road to 100K. Um, just be a, a subscriber to the channel and then, you know, find the, the giveaways you're interested in, submit your information there, and uh, you might can win some really, really cool stuff. So, well, as always, Jonathan, hope you get to feeling better, man. I know you weren't feeling too great, but glad you could stop by and hang out with us for a little bit. Ryan, as always, it's always a pleasure to hang out with you. Yeah, you too. Hope you guys have an incredible week, and we'll catch you in the next live stream. Take care.